series this month on discipleship. So throughout this month of October, we're going to learn what it means to be a disciple and how we can influence others for the kingdom of God. The scripture that will be our focus throughout this whole month is found in Matthew 9, verse 35 through 38. If you want to mark that, get used to it because you're going to be hearing it every week. So I'll throw in a different translation for you so it changes it out just a little bit. So this morning I'll start with reading from the NIV, the New International Version. There it says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the word of God, for the people of God. Now, if we were to look around us, we would see that the harvest is still plentiful. According to a 2015 article at churchleaders.com by Kelly Shattuck, there it says that fewer than 20% of Americans regularly attend church. Let me put that in perspective for you. According to the 2013 census, Apple Creek had a population of 1,178 people. If only 20% of them attended the church, that'd be around 236 people, which means that we have 943 people around us that don't attend church on Sunday mornings. Let that sink in for just a moment. Currently, we find that in the United States, only 6% of the churches are growing. That means 94% of the churches are losing ground in the communities that they serve. Today, not unlike the time of Jesus and the early church, people have a deep spiritual needs. They have a longing for meaning in their lives. Some of them, they may feel harassed and helpless, like we saw in our scripture. Others are searching for good news. Some seek healing. Jesus still looks over the towns and the villages, and he has compassion for all the people. And we should, too, as his disciples. Let me ask, take you back to your childhood for a moment. Do you remember this nursery rhyme? Here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. Well, today, it would be more like open the doors and where are all the people? The problem, though, it's not a lack of people. The problem is the inability to see those that are around us and to reach them. Remember those 943 neighbors that are not connected to any worshiping community? As disciples, we've forgotten our purpose and why we're called to reach out in the first place. And I'm not speaking just about here, but all across the United States. Churches and disciples have forgotten their purpose. During the Great Depression, there was a philanthropist who hired a number of people to build a road. Now this person's intentions were good, but the task didn't have a goal. You see, the road didn't have a destination. It was a literal road to nowhere. As the workers began to realize that their work didn't serve any purpose at all, their enthusiasm waned and the project was eventually abandoned. 
when we talk about being disciples, we need some clarity of what our end goal is supposed to be. We need the reason behind the mission. So we're going to call that our why. We'll get into a little more detail about our why next week. So if we are going to intentionally build a road of discipleship, we must know why we're doing it. We need to know the path that we're going to take. And we need to know where it's going to lead. We cannot continue building roads that lead to nowhere and expect things to change. Unintentionally over the years, we have lost our focus on intentional discipleship. We have forgotten why we said yes to Jesus. And we have stopped growing as disciples. We have forgotten that the path of discipleship is a lifelong journey of growth and maturing. Being a disciple is much like marriage. You need to work at it. You need to remember why you fell in love in the first place. You need to continue to support each other and grow in your relationship. What happens if you lose focus on your marriage? What happens if you stop paying attention to your spouse? Quite simply, life isn't going to be very enjoyable and you won't live that happily ever after. To bring us back into focus and to rediscover our enthusiasm and our driving force, we need to remember the what, the how, and the why of discipleship. So today we'll begin with the what. Now if someone was to say to you, tell me a little bit about what your church does. What would you say? Anybody? Reaches out to the community. What else does the church do? Puts on good food. Puts on good food. <laughs> what else does the church do? Feeds the hungry. Feeds the hungry. What else does the church do? Worship God. Worship God. The typical response to that question was to list the activities and ministries that we provide, which you clearly did. Thank you. Things like we worship at 10 o'clock. We go to have Sunday school for the children. We have a food pantry, we have a Bible study, we do mission trips, and so on and so on. All these things are good, and they should be a part of what we do as a church, but they should not be the response to the question, what does your church do? I see some perplexed looks, so I will explain. If we take a look at paragraph 120 of the Book of Discipline, the church is supposed to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So, this is what we should be doing, making disciples. Churches do a lot of things, but are they making and growing disciples? Before we go any further, I think we need to clarify what a disciple is and how they're transformed. A disciple is someone who believes in Jesus and seeks to follow him in their daily life. A disciple also wants to learn from Jesus, so they study their Bible regularly. They meet with others to learn more and to hear from others. Discipleship is a lifestyle. Disciples are continual learners. As disciples, we are called to make more disciples. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now I have to say there is no cookie-cutter approach to making disciples. Each person's journey is unique. If I was going around the room today and ask you your personal story, there would not be two that would be the same. Each of us also have a role to play in our own growth, in our accountability to and with other disciples, and the formation of other disciples. 
If we look back at that passage from Matthew, the key word found there is go. Christianity is a going religion. We are a going faith. Our mission is rooted in this great commission. The Methodist movement is rooted in going to the people with a passion to make disciples. Over time, though, we have forgotten the power that fueled our passion. If we want to thrive as disciples, if we want to thrive as a church, we need to embody the characteristics of disciples. And we need to know what our end product, the type of disciples that our church hopes to produce. We need to think about how our church's ministries and opportunities work together to assist in disciple formation. We need to find and embrace a vision of how we are going to fulfill Jesus' great commission right here in Apple Creek. Our mission needs to be rooted in love for God's children. Our love needs to pull us forward to give us the courage and the willingness to go wherever God leads us. John Wesley wrote in 1743 a track entitled, The Character of a Methodist. There he said that we always exercise our love to God by praying without ceasing, by rejoicing evermore, and in everything giving thanks. The commandment, he who loves God loves his brother, is written on their hearts. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we follow these guidelines, we show it by engaging in our community, extending the church's reach and transforming the world begins with love. For God so loved the world, and so should we. Now, if we intentionally focus on developing ourselves into disciples of Jesus, continue growing and maturing our faith, then this genuine love for others follows. When we rekindle the passion for the mission, we'll move outside of ourselves and into the desire to engage our community in real, meaningful, and transformational ways. The only way a church can remain vital is through a concerted and intimate re-engagement with the community that they serve. We need to see all the people that God has called us to reach. That is the foundation for effective ministry. We need to immerse ourselves in the lives of the people who are outside of our doors. So this morning I want you to watch a commercial as put out by the Saturn Company back in 2002. Bear with me as I can get that pulled up for you. 